Thus far we have been blessed. Amen? Amen. Indeed, the Bible said to train up a child in the way that he should go. When they're old, they will not depart from it. God blesses the little children. They are the future of the church. And we have to train them aright. May God bless the parents as well. I am happy to be here this Sabbath. It has been a while that I've been away from you. But I want to assure you that even though you haven't seen me, you are in my prayers. I've been praying for this church, the members, and the leadership of this church because there are not many churches like these around. So indeed, we have to pray that God will continue to bless and to uphold this church. This morning, I want to speak to you lessons from 1 Kings, particularly repairing the altar. As I thought about this message, I thought to myself, what title should I give to this message? It will be a series of messages which I intend to bring from 1 Kings in particular. But I thought to myself when I reflected on the ministry of Jesus Christ. You know, thinking about it, Jesus never named his sermons. It was men that gave name to Jesus' sermons. Take, for instance, Sermon on the Mount. Did Jesus name that sermon, Sermon on the Mount? No, he did not. It was man that gave it that name. It is as if as Jesus surveyed the congregation in which he was at the time, he developed that particular message for that congregation. And I believe as ministers that we ought to pattern Christ closely. Sometimes you may go to a church and you have a particular message, but based on what you see, you have to switch that message. Be instant, in season, and out of season. Amen. So this morning, I'm coming from 1 Kings, and I hope and pray that you will be blessed. For those of us who have already made Jesus our Lord and Savior, I pray that your walk will become closer. But for those who have not yet, their names are not yet registered in the book of life. I pray that today will be the day of salvation for you. Amen. Amen. With that said, I'm going to pray and I ask you to bow your heads as we ask God's presence this morning. Heavenly Father, I am but a lump of clay. You are the potter this morning. I pray to your God that the words that proceed from my mouth will be words coming from the throne room above. Take away from me anything you don't want me to say. And give me that which you want me to say. I pray to your God that this morning we will feel the power of the Holy Spirit. Life will be changed. Hearts will be converted. Indeed, O oh Lord... We can say at the end of these days, message, it was good for us to be here because we have gained a closer experience with the man Christ Jesus. Thank you for hearing our prayers, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. First Kings, repairing the altar. You know, as an auto technician, I know a lot about repairing. It is my livelihood. And those that experience problems with their vehicle, they take it to the dealership to get it repaired. And for those who work in different spheres of life, they know something about repair. Whether you're buying, whether you have owned or renting, you know something about repairs. Sometimes the water pipe broke and you have to get a plumber to repair it. Am I right? Amen. You have to know something about repairing. And this morning I'm here to tell you, beloved friends, that the word repairing, it just simply means, in the theological terms, it is restoring true worship. In God's church. That's what repairing of the altar really means. It's restoring true worship 
in God's church. You know, it is said that coming events cast their shadows before them. You go outside and you look and you see the sky and it looks cloudy. First thing comes to your mind is that what? It's going to rain. Common events cast their shadows before them. And beloved friends, as you experience and you go through life, we are told that the Old Testament book that we have, it is written for our admonition upon whom the kings, the ends of this world are come. Now, beloved friends, during the time of Israel, as they traveled through and through, Israel went into national apostasy. It was a time when Israel did not know their true God anymore. And for that, we are going to be looking at this morning the northern kingdom of Israel. You have to understand, beloved friends, that because Solomon, who was then the king in Israel, the Bible said that he loves <laughs> strange women. He had many wives and many concubines, and it displeases the Lord. And the Lord said to him that I'm going to take away the kingdom because you have not walked in your father's David's steps. And we have this account in 1 Kings 11, 29, 32, that when Solomon passed, the Bible tells us that Jeroboam, the prophet Ahijah saw him and he took a hold of his garment and he tore it into ten pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, the Lord shall tear away the kingdom from Solomon and shall give ten kingdoms to you. And Ahijah, he, he charged Jeroboam to walk in the statues of the Lord. And so Israel was no longer one. Israel was now divided. Ten tribes went to Jeroboam. And two tribes went to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. So the southern kingdom was where Rehoboam, Rehoboam reigned in Judah, Jerusalem. And the northern kingdom was where Jeroboam reigns. And it is said, beloved friends, that there were seven kings that reigned over the ten tribes and all of them without exception were wicked kings. Seven kings and the most famous of them, beloved friends, is the king Jeroboam. We have a sad account of Jeroboam in the scriptures. The Bible tells us in 1 Kings 12 verses 26, the Bible said, and Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. You see, beloved friends, that worship, corporal worship, took place in Jerusalem. And at a time when the children of Israel would have go up to Jerusalem to do sacrifice unto the Lord, Jeroboam said in his heart that if the children of Israel should leave and go up to Jerusalem then they won't come back down here for me to be their king. And so what Jeroboam did, he devised the way to keep the children of Israel from going up to Jerusalem. Just like today, <laughs> there are many congregations who said, don't come to this church, because if you come, you won't come back. <laughs> and as a result, the Bible tells us, beloved friends, if these people go up to sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of these people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. And it says in verse 28, Whereupon the king took counsel, and he made two calves of gold, and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the house of Egypt. And so Jeroboam made calves for the children of Israel to worship. 
because he didn't want them to go up to Jerusalem to experience true worship. The Bible tells us in verse 9, 29, And he set the one in Bethel, and the other put he in Dan, and this thing became a sin. For the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan. This became a sin in Israel. It was in the wisdom of God that God decided that he was going to take ten tribes away from the kingdom of David and give ten tribes to Jeroboam. But Jeroboam devised in his mind that if the children of Israel go up to Jerusalem and as a result, beloved friends, the Bible says that this thing became a sin in Israel. Goes further than that. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar, so did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he made. This man decided that for this new congregation, he's going to need leaders. And what he did, he devised of him own self leaders and he placed them in the high places. Priests, the Bible said, he made in the high places. Now I want you to note, beloved friends, that apostasy begins with the corrupting of the priesthood. By installing into the divine service men who were never called or equipped by God. And today we have this problem in the Adventist church. Amen. There are too many men, beloved friends, who are standing on the pulpit who God never called. Amen. And as a result, the corruption yes. that we find, beloved friends, always begins with the leaders. Amen. God have a fix for it as you will see as we progress. We're told the king tried to persuade the Levites, some whom from were living within his realm, to serve as priests in the newly erected shrines at Bethel and Dan. But in this effort, he met with failure. He was therefore compelled to elevate to the priesthood men from the lowest of the people. He decided that the men who were standing straight, who weren't going to bow to the idols, and so he decided that I need a new line of priests. He got his own to put in the churches. To keep the congregation. Alarm, she says, over the prospect. Many of the faithful, including a great number of the Levites, fled to Jerusalem. Where they might worship in harmony with the divine requirements. And let me tell you something, church. And those that are viewing online. If you're in a church where the truth is not being preached, you need to follow this. She said that they went up to Jerusalem where they might worship in harmony. And many are sitting in an airing church listening to the same dead sermon every single Sabbath. The drums are beating and your heart is pounding and you still sit there. Go up to Jerusalem to experience true worship. But of all these kings, beloved friends, after Jeroboam, the Bible tells us that Nadab, he was next in line. And Nadab, the man who actually murdered him, took his place. His name is Basha. After Basha, you have Elah. This man was a murderer. And after him, then you have Zimri. He was guilty of treason. And after Zimri, you have Omri. A matter of fact, he was the founder of Samaria. And the Bible gives us this account of Omri. The Bible says, But Omri wrought evil in the eyes of the Lord and did worse than all that were before him. For he walked in all the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nadab. All seven kings that came in line, they all walked in the steps of Jeroboam. But out of all these, beloved friends, let me tell you, there is one that topped the list, and his name is Ahab. 
We have this account of Ahab in 1 Kings 16, 29. The Bible says, And in the thirty and eighth year of Asa king of Judah began Ahab the son of Omri to reign over Israel. And Ahab the son of Omri reigned over Israel in Samaria twenty and two years. And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that was before him. He was not a good king. Verse 31 says, And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam. To him, practicing the sins of Jeroboam was nothing. It was a very light thing to him. He didn't see anything wrong with it. And the Bible gives us another account that he took it a step further. The Bible says, continue, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, of the Zidonians, and went and he served Baal, and he worshipped him. Following in the footsteps of Jeroboam wasn't bad enough to Ahab. <laughs> he took it a step further. And he married Jezebel. Now let's break down these characters. Ethbel. Who is he now? His name simply means I'm with Baal. <laughs> and believe it or not, he was the high priest of Baal. Now Jezebel, who was his daughter, who Ahab married, matter of fact, in the Phoenician poem, it is says, Where is Baal, the overcomer? Where is the prince? Where is the prince in the Phoenician is Isabel. That's where the name Jezebel comes from. Isabel. And you have to understand, beloved friends, then this was no ordinary woman. The Bible tells us in, in, in Kings that she was a harlot woman. And she wasn't just no ordinary harlot woman. This woman had an entourage with her when she moved into the palace with Ahab. The Bible tells us that she had 850 prophets traveling with her. Finally, when that moving van backed up at Ahab's residence, she took with her all her luggage. She did not only brought her luggage, but she brought her religion. Changes was coming now into Israel. And as a result, beloved friends, it is says that Jezebel was beating the drum and Ahab was playing the flute and Israel was just going along with the beat down to the road to hell. Amen. And so it is today. Jezebel is still beating the drum. Ahab is still playing the flute and many of us are on our way down to hell, beloved friends. Not realizing who is playing the drum and who is playing the flute. We are told not only did Ahab introduce Baal worship at the capital city, but under the leadership of Jezebel, he erected heathen altars in many high places where in the shelter of surrounding groves, the priests and others connected with this seductive form of idolatry exerted their baleful influence until well nigh all Israel were following after Baal. This was national apostasy. The Bible tells us in Kings, 1632 and he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal which he had built in Samaria and he also made groves and he went a step further the Bible tells us now in verse 34 in his days did Heliel the Bethelite build Jericho now this is interesting under Ahab Jericho was rebuilt now, if you recall, beloved friends, we are told in the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 6, verse 26, Joshua put, made a curse on any man who built Jericho. Here it is. And Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Curse be the man before the Lord that raised it up and build this city again. Jericho was not to be rebuilt. 
But because Ahab and his entourage were in full apostasy, there was no limit for the king. He reared up. We're told in 1 Kings 21, 25, but there was none like unto Ahab, which sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel, his wife, stared up. None like Ahab in all of Israel. I read one, once that some men, it seems, will just be just as wicked as their woman wants them to be. These men have no backbone. They will say and they will do whatever their wives want them to be. And Ahab was just that man. He was a jellyback man and he could not say no to Jezebel because Jezebel was the one wearing the pants. And that's what happens in a home when you have a weak husband and a strong wife. Problems? Because it's the other way around. We're told Ahab was weak in moral power. And his union by marriage with this idolatrous woman of decided character and positive temperament resulted disastrously both to himself and to the nation unprincipled and with no high standard of right doing his character was easily molded by the determined spirit of Jezebel she was leading him with a string Mr. Spurgeon said the influence of this woman was his curse and his ruin how many men have been destroyed in that way it is always perilous to be under the influence of an unconverted person. He said it is supremely dangerous to be under the fascination of a wicked woman. And let me tell you, beloved friends, there are many who is in the church and they're looking for a husband or a wife and they go out and they say, oh yes, I'll bring him in. <laughs> oh, let me tell you, you're making one of the biggest mistakes of your life. The biggest mistake of your life. Now I'm telling you beloved friends. The Bible says have no relationship with Baal. You can't be in the church and you're seeking somebody in the world. To create a mixture of these two is to bring confusion into your life. And so as a result of this. Baalism now became the state's religion. Jehovah was now put out. <laughs> Baal was put in. I want you to stay with me. Now, who was Baal? Let me give you a brief survey. He was the sun god. In all religion, Baal was the sun god. And he may take on different forms and call different names, but really, truly, it's still Baal. He was the sun god. A matter of fact, the Hebrew word for Baal means Lord, possessor, or husband. So in other words, what Israel had done, they had divorced themselves from God. And they have now taken on a different husband. Now, he is also known as the storm god. And you're going to see why this is important. He was responsible for the fertility of the country. This was his role in Israel as the sun god. Now, follow me now very carefully as I read this statement. Moth, whose name means death, and he was another god, was the god of drought and what? Sterility. He presided over the dry season and appeared in Canaanite mythology as what? Baal's chief antagonist. When Moth came, Baal's time was over and he had to pass from the scene. He was ordered to take everything connected with fertility into the depths of the earth. As he descended into the earth, the season of drought arrived and rain and clouds vanished. The streams dried up and the, vege vege the vegetation languished. Follow me now carefully. Baal's worshippers... They would cry out to Baal when they want and they were asking for these things in Israel. Where is Baal the overcomer? 
during the dry season. Because remember the statement we read, when moth come, he had to what? Go underground. Because the dry season has come. So they cry out, where is Baal? Where is the prince, the lord of the earth? Our king is Baal, the overcomer, our judge, and no one is above him. This is how Israel, the God that brought them out of Egypt, this is what they were doing at this time. Baal worship was the most degrading religious system ever devised. And the Phoenician Baalism was the worst of the lot. It's thought by some scholars that the Phoenician coast was settled by the refugees from where? Sodom and Gomorrah, who fled the valley of Sidon when their cities were destroyed and who brought with them their depraved culture. So don't think of Baal worship as just bowing down and just worshiping. It goes much deeper than that, beloved friends. Now, let me give you a list of things that Baal worshippers, the children of Israel, was engaging. We're going to make the application. Just stick with me. The worshippers of Baal, they were engaged in a catalog of sexual divinity. Now, beloved friends, what are some of these things? Polygamy. They had this down path. They were also engaged in polyantry. This is when a woman decides that she wants more than one husband. She is not comfortable with one man. And this is going on now in society. You ever heard about wife swaps? That's something that's going on on TV right now. They were engaged in prostitution. They were also engaged in adultery, fornication, rape, and they were engaged in incest, the worshippers of Baal. They were engaged in homosexual partners. Hmm. They were also engaged in bestiality. You find, beloved friends, that Baal worship did not only have what you call just bow down and worship. It came with a litany, a catalog of sexual activities. Depraved in nature. And they had this one. Pederasty. This is when you have grown men messing with little boys. These things Israel, God's favorite people, were practicing at this time. National apostasy. Now, you think, beloved friends, in the mind of God, when God saw these sins in the church, I can only imagine that the wrath of God was now stirred in him. And he decided that there was time for judgment. The wrath of God had come. It is said that almost every event has its prophetic prelude. And you know that when these sins become prevalent in the church, God is about to work. Amen. God is about to act. Beloved friends, this man here, Dortmund Professor Jeffrey Hart, in a recent speech was reported by the Wall Street Journal. He's an old, old man now, but he made this statement a while ago. He said, a great many things happen all of a sudden in this country in the very recent past. He said, without going into the right and the wrong of every case, I list them objectively within living memory. The man says abortion was a felony in virtually every state in the nation. And he says, demands that it be federally funded are alleged to be rooted into the Constitution. Did you know that? He goes on to say that hardcore pornography was largely kept out of sight. He says, usually by a rough argument between sellers and authorities, 
He says, now the hardcore stuff is available in every newspaper. It's available on your television. And it's available on your smartphone. You better be careful what you type in. He goes on to say homosexuals were for the most part discreet. Suddenly we find that they demand public leg legitimization of their what? Peculiarity stage parades demand and representation in government bodies as a legitimate minority. The man says this is where we are right now. They were discreet beloved friends. But not anymore. They are now out of the closet and it now seems that they are the majority and we are the minority. You dare not speak out against them. I'm going to play a clip, my brother. And it's around three minutes long, but I think it will be worth your time Welcome watching. to Christian World News, everyone. I'm Wendy Griffith. And I'm George Thomas. In Canada, a radical sex ed curriculum being pushed in public schools by the LGBT community has parents afraid their children will become confused and even brainwashed. That's exactly right, George. But as I discovered in my recent trip to Canada, there could be a silver lining. This issue is waking up a sleeping church. A family can be made up in many different ways. It's Rob called SOGI for sexual orientation dad, and gender identification. And a curriculum that teaches family. public school students across Canada to, to celebrate the homosexual that lifestyle is that and that gender yeah. is fluid. Is no. In other words, no. your gender is not dependent on what parts you were born with, but rather what you feel like in the moment. There's people that are boys, there's people that are girls. There are, peop there are people whose gender might be a little bit of both or might even be neither. Lessons include books about transgender children, such as 10,000 Dresses, and songs like The Rainbow Song. Gender won't decide the choices we make. Some boys like dressing up, some girls like catching snakes. The SOGI curriculum started in British Columbia in 2016 and is quickly spreading throughout Canada. I just thought, who decided that this was okay to teach our children. Author and inspirational speaker Laura Lynn Tyler Thompson is a leading voice against the SOGI curriculum. And we are seeing the results of that now because some kids are reacting very emotionally and saying, you know, and they're in fear. Will I be, you know, will I suddenly struggle with feeling like a different gender inside of my body? No. Carrie Simpson of Culture Guard, another leading opponent, calls the curriculum nothing short of child abuse. All those beautiful qualities that make young girls beautiful girls and women are being basically vilified. The things that make our boys boys are being, you know, taken from them. Um, so things of equating young men to being strong protectors is something that's now evil. But Morgan Auger, a transsexual and supporter, claims it's about acceptance, not indoctrination. The idea is to teach kids that there are gay kids and there are trans kids and there are trans parents and gay parents in our society and, the, and everybody's wanted and desired. After all, that's what our human rights code says and it's the role of schools to teach the, to teach the following of our laws, right? Simpson disagrees, saying she sees Soji's real goal as altering our culture from a heteronormative society into one where anything goes, no boundaries, no values, no morals. Um, it's a hedonistic uh, cult, basically what they're Im implying. Another blaring example, drag queen story time. It's happening in Canada and America, where some public schools and libraries invite drag queens, some dressed like torn demons, to read to young children. And it's a social deconstructionist agenda. They're using children, little five-year-olds, to accomplish this. And parents are waking up and saying no. When asked about parents' rights, OJ says... Well, actually, in Canada, parents' rights are limited. And children's rights are put ahead. <laughs> Church, let me tell you. This is no other than Baal worship in another farm. They are using children to push their agenda. 
A matter of fact, the story goes on to say that a little boy was in the toy room playing with a girl toy. And the teacher comes in and said to the little boy, oh, you're playing with a, with a girl toy. You may be a girl. These are things that are happening in the schools, beloved friends. And this is where we are today. It is nothing more than Baal worship in another form. With all its catalog of activities. And today, everybody is silent. Nobody says nothing. What is happening to us, beloved friends? Where are the voices to cry out at the, uh, about these things? Nobody wants to get in trouble. So everybody just sits still and say nothing. David says in Psalms 119, he says, It is time for thee to act, O Lord, for they have made void thy law. These things will bring the judgment of God upon this world. And as a result, if everything goes, it is now a growing sense that nothing is true and everything is permitted. If nothing is true, then yes, everything is permitted. Because nothing is wrong. Fyodor says in his book, if God does not exist, everything is permissible. And this is where the world has taken the church. Because in the church now, if you tell someone that what they're doing is wrong, they said, who told you that? Huh. It's permissible. Our scripture reading... David says in Psalms 12, 8, the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Today you do right. They don't think of you as being a good person. The wicked walk in the street when the vilest man is exalted. And today vice is applauded and virtue is trampled underfoot. That's the society we have come to live in this 21st century. The Bible says in Isaiah 59 verse 14, Judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the street, and there is no equity. He goes on to say in verse 15, Yea, truth faileth, and he that departed from evil maketh himself a prey. <laughs> That's the society we are living in, beloved friends. And it had made, it had infiltrated the church. Yes. The wise man said in Ecclesiastes 8.11, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore the hearts of the sons of men are set on to do evil. Because God sits back for a minute, and he doesn't do anything yet, we permit and we continue in our wicked lifestyle. Secondly, it says that there is no final standard. Everything varies now according to the weather. <laughs> it depends on how you feel in the moment. <laughs> if it feel good, do it. But we have a standard, beloved friends. And we are told in 1 Peter 2.21 For even unto where he are called because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example leaving us a standard to follow. We have a standard. She said in Councils and Help page 626 Choose poverty, reproach, separation from friends or any suffering rather than to defile the soul with sin. Death before dishonor or the transgression of God's law should be the motto of every Christian. As a people professing to be reformers, treasuring the most solemn purifying truths of God's word, we must elevate the standard, she says, far higher than it is at the present time. The standard must go up. 
And sin must be eradicated from our lives. G. Greek, Tristan says, morality like art consists of drawing a straight line. But he says, no, no one knows where to draw the line anymore. We don't know when to stop. And we are on the downward course to perdition. The Wall Street Journal published the post. They said, we have reached a state where common decency isn't common anymore. This is the state that the world in the 21st century have found itself, beloved friends, just as it was in ancient Israel. And the church is not immune to these things. But praise be to God, God is not at a loss. He may be sitting still, but he's not inactive. He is working out things in his own order. And in his own time, he will make the move. We are told in Patriots and Prophet page 115 that darkness as a shadow covered the whole land in Israel. And today you find that the church, beloved friends, is heading down that path that ancient Israel was in. But I picture in a man's eyes, there was a man somewhere, and he was God's man, a man named Elijah. He was the man to check the evil in Israel. But I picture is Elijah this morning. Let's say Elijah goes to school to sit down. And as the teacher looked at him, he noticed that this little man was different. (laughs) His dress was different. His speech was different. And the teacher said to Elijah, young man, we're going to start with adjustment this morning. You need to be adjusted. You need to adjust yourself now to Jezebel. You need to adjust yourself to Baalism. You need to adjust yourself to the way how we do praise and worship around here. You need to adjust yourself to the drum playing. You need to adjust yourself to the beat this morning. Praise be to God, the man of God would have none of that. We are told that the worship of God will become corrupt unless there are wide awake men at every post of duty. Praise God, Elijah was at his post of duty. Mr. Spurgeon says, when nations are to perish in their sins, it is in the church the leprosy begins. The priest whose office is with zeal sincere to watch the fountain and preserve it clear. He carelessly nods and he sleeps upon the brink while others poison what the flock must drink. The unsuspecting sheep believes it pure, tainted by the very means of cure. Truth is hush that heresy may preach. But all is trash that reason cannot reach. This is where we are. We have to stand at our post. And praise be to God, Elijah was at his post to check this wickedness in Israel. He was a man of his time. He had found the holy in the midst of the unholy. Oh yes, he had found the infinite in the midst of the finite. He had found the perfect in the midst of the imperfect. And he had found the true God in the midst of many God. Elijah was a man for his time. And we need some Elijahs today to repair the altar of the Lord. She says Elijah saw Israel going deeper and deeper into idolatry. And his soul was stirred and his indignation arose. As he saw Israel heading deeper and deeper. And as you see this Adventist church going deeper and deeper. Your soul must arose in you. I picture this man. As he sits and he contemplates. He remembers how God led the children of Israel. When Moses met the great Jehovah at the burning bush. And I know he pictured Moses on his way down into Pharaoh's court. He pictures when Moses gave these signs to let them know that Jehovah God reigns. He pictures Moses gave these signs, beloved friends, to let them know that God was in control of nature. There were hails. 
There were locusts, and finally darkness came upon Pharaoh's house. Yes, he pictures the children of Israel leaving Egypt <laughs> under the mighty hand of God. He pictures Moses as he stood upon the rock and he said to the children of Israel, Fear not, for today you shall see the Egyptians no more. He pictures them walking through the dry ground. The Bible tells us in Hebrews eleven twenty nine 29 that by faith they walked on dry grounds. I know that he pictured the children of Israel as they traveled through that water, beloved friends, that Pharaoh and his army pursued after them. And he saw how God took the wheels off Pharaoh's chariot. <laughs> they were all drowned. Yes, he pictured the children of Israel as they were there at the base of Mount Sinai and God spoke in thunderous tones. And they quaked and trembled at the voice of God. Finally, he pictured the children of Israel. God gave them rest under the leadership of Joshua. Finally, beloved friend, Deuteronomy 28, 8, the Bible says, And the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with great herbalness, and with signs and wonders. God led them out of Egypt. O oh, you hearers here before me this morning, had not God led you out of Egypt? Did not God lead you out of spiritual Egypt? But sadly, some of us, while we profess to be worshipping Jehovah, we are still at the shrines of Baal. If the curtains could be rolled back this morning, how many of us would seek the back door? Oh, you, my hearers, think of where God has brought you from. Did not he lead you out of spiritual Egypt? As Elijah thought about these things, we are told in 1 Kings 17.1 that Elijah the Tishbite who was of the inhabitant of Gilead. Now his name alone, beloved friends, should ring a bell. Because El is the prefix for, Jeho for Elohim. And when you break up this word and you look at it, Elijah, Elijah, El for Elohim and Jah for Jehovah. <laughs> His name in itself represents the true God. The Hebrew word means Jehovah is my God. <laughs> now I want you to know this man's brief introduction to himself. Elijah, the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead. Note now, there is nothing concerning the prophet's call or his earthly experience. There is no long oration of who this man is. He is called Elijah, the Tishbite. He didn't introduce himself as, I'm Dr. So-and-so. Hmm. And I am from so-and-so. He didn't introduce himself as, I've attended such and such a university. <laughs> he didn't introduce himself as, and I have a PhD in such and such. He didn't introduce himself as, I serve as president of such and such a conference. Amen. He introduced himself as Elijah the Tishbite. Amen. Today what we need is a very short <laughs> introduction. Amen. We don't need to hear all your qualifications. Amen. But today we have gone in a different line of things. We have now adapted what the Babylonians are doing. Yes. We go and we seek for all these high accolades. So that when we come before God's people, we can announce who we are. Yes. And when it's time to speak, you have nothing to say. Yes. 
We need Elijah the Tishbite this morning. We're told that this man hold, he occupied no high station in life. He is only introduced as Elijah the Tishbite from the inhabitants of Gilead. 1 Corinthians 1.26 says, For he see your calling, brethren, how that not many men, not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty men, not many nobled are called. Matter of fact, I read somewhere that a noble woman who was of the noble abilities somewhere over there in England, that as she read the Bible, she said she was, she was saved by this letter. Not the word, the letter M. Because she was of nobility. And because she read, he says, not many wise, she said, he did not say not any. He said not many. <laughs> you didn't get that. <laughs> now, beloved friends, he was of the inhabitants of Gilead. Don't run past that. In fact, we are told that Elijah was of the inhabitants of Gilead is in no doubt recorded as a side light upon his natural training. One who ever exerted a powerful influence on the forming of character. The people of those hills reflect the nature of their environment. They were rough and rugged, but they were solemn, stern, dwelling in road villages and subsisting by keeping flocks of sheep, hardened by open ear life, dressed in a cloak of camel's hair, and accustomed to spreading most of his time in solitude. That's why we are told to get out of the city, beloved friends. This man's retreat was in the mountain. <laughs> You're not hearing me this morning, church. A matter of fact, 2 Kings 1, 8 says, when this man, a matter of fact, let me give you the background for it. Ahijah was sick. And he sent his servant to go inquire of Beelzebub and as the servant was on his way to Beelzebub he met the prophet and the prophet turned him back and said go tell the king that he shall not recover and the king asked his servant who was he and this was the servant's reply here it is and he answered him he was a what a hairy man girded with a girdle of leather about his loins and he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. <laughs> he was known by name. Yes. He was known by character. <laughs> he could tell that this man was the man of God. Amen. Based upon his attire. Amen. Are you known by your dress this morning? Yes. Are you known by what you're wearing? When you go out on the street, can they tell that you're a seven-day Adventist? Are you dressed above your knee this morning? Or is it below your knees? Are your pants close to you this morning? Or do you have some room? He was known by his attire this morning. 1 Kings 19.10 says... And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant. This man had a burning in his heart because the children of Israel had forsaken the covenant of the Lord. They were worshipping Baal. They found themselves in promiscuous activities. Their attire had changed. Their style of worship had changed. And there was need for a repairing of the altar. Elijah the Tishbite. My text this morning that was read so ably. David says, if the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Well, I have another question. What did Elijah do? When Elijah saw that the foundation was being destroyed, what did he do? 
we found the answer in James chapter 5, verse 17. The Bible says, Elijah was a man subject to like passion as we are, and he prayed earnestly. <laughs> the man was praying Amen. for Israel. Yes, sir. Are you praying this morning for Mother and Israel? Amen. The foundation were being destroyed, and Elijah took to his knees. Yes. The man begins to pray, beloved friends. Yes. Oh, Mr. Spurgeon says, constant in prayer. Elijah found himself being constant in prayer. He was praying for the welfare of the church because he saw the church going down. The church was heading down to never be recovered. He saw Elijah, he was instant in prayer. At all moments, not actually on your knees praying, but always in the attitude of prayer. Amen. Oh, when someone cross you at work, you have to be in the attitude of prayer. And I'm telling you, I was surely tempted this week. <laughs> and <laughs> I said, tell your beloved friend, the devil got the best of me. But I am praying that God will have mercy. <laughs> Every time something rub you the wrong way, you must be instant immediately send up a word Amen. then you must have expectancy yes. <laughs> you can't be constant and be instant without expectancy yes. because you must expect that God can do something for you yes. and Elijah he was constant in prayer he was instant in prayer but he had expectancy in prayer Luke 18, 1, Jesus himself told us that man ought always to pray and not to faint. Amen. Church, are you praying for a loved one this morning? Amen. Are you praying for your word word children? Yes. Are you praying for your neighbor? Amen. You ought to be always in prayer yes. and not faint. Was the commission from our Lord and Savior. You must know how to wrestle with God in prayer. As Jacob wrestled with the angel and overcome. Amen. Stay on your knees, said the song. That's where you'll find the strength to move on. Amen. Prayer, beloved friends. If you can give up anything, don't give up prayer. Amen. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way. He says, then I will hear from heaven. Amen. Expectancy. <laughs> you will get the, the desire of your heart. The Bible says he prayed. But he was not only in prayer. Amen. Because we are told he that does all but praying will soon cease to pray. <laughs> So yes, the man of God was praying. Yes. But the Bible goes a little further and tells us what he was praying. The Bible says in James 5, 17, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. He was praying that there will be no rain. What a prayer to pray. Amen. <laughs> you would question and say, what an evil prayer to pray. <laughs> why would you pray that there will be no rain but the man knew what was at stake God's church was in trouble and he was praying that God will lock up the heaven beloved friends yes. he prayed that there will be no rain for three and a half years Mr. Spurgeon says such language would be blasphemy if it were not permitted it would be presumption if it were not encouraged. Let me tell you, beloved friends, when you find your suit, you must pray and call it by name. Yes. What was he praying? And why was he praying that there'll be no rain? You must ask yourself that question. You see, the man was a man of the Bible. He was a man of the Old Testament. And Elijah was studying the Old Testament. And as he studied the Old Testament, he came upon a particular 
verse in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 11. And that was the reason why he was praying that there be no rain. You have to understand, beloved friend, that the man found a curse. And he found that God had made a promise that if the children of Israel disobeyed, this would come upon his people. And he was praying that God's promise may be fulfilled. Here it is. Verse 16 says, Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived and he turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you and he shut up the heaven that there be no rain and that the land heal not her fruit unless he perish quickly. From off the good land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Elijah lighted upon this promise and he begins to pray. <laughs> he says, Lord, your servant Moses prophesied that if the children of Israel turn and begin to worship other gods, you're going to shut up the heaven. No, dear God, we are here, dear God. Shut up the heavens. Mr. Spurgeon says, when you have found the promise, Lay your finger on it. <laughs> Better still with your spirit, grasp it in your hand and go before God with it. If prayer be as Luther calls it, bombard a Christian Aram, the Christian's great gun with which he bombards heaven, <laughs> then surely the promise is the shot which he sends forth. When you find the promise in the word of God, put your finger on it. Plead, he says, the promise by saying, Lord, do as thou hast said. Fulfill this word unto thy servant upon which thou hast caused me to hope. Lord, your promise is in the word. I am claiming this promise. Elijah had found it. And he was claiming it. <laughs> the Bible said he prayed earnestly. First John 5 14 says and this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will <laughs> he hears us Amen. church let me tell you when you find God promise if it's according to his will he have to hear us he can't deny us. He may say, wait, but he have to hear us. Amen. Because God is not a man that he should lie. Amen. She said the word of God came to. The word of the Lord came to him and jealous for the honor of God's cause. He did not hesitate. <laughs> The man prayed and finally after praying earnestly, the word of God came to his ears. And when he heard it, she said he did not hesitate to obey the divine command. Let me tell you, church. Some of us make so much plans that we have no room for God in our plans. We are praying for something, but our plans are interfering with what we are praying for. Elijah made himself available. He had rooms in his plan. <laughs> he was praying, but he was praying and the word came to him to go see Ahab. The word didn't come to someone else. The word came to him because he was praying. Some of us, we are praying that pastor not do so and so. Why you don't pray that you do it? Amen. 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 If the word came to you, why don't you do it? Amen. 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 David Roper said, we should hold our plans loosely. Amen. Give God the right to revise them. 
or replace them entirely. Permitting him to advise, correct, and to prompt us. Don't hold your plan so tightly, church. Because God may need to revise them. Some of us are planning to go east. Some are planning to go west. You better hold it lightly. Because God may have a different plan for you. <laughs> In the providence of God, you may want to go west. God's providence lead you east. Hold them loosely. Finally, the man decided, okay, I'm the man for this mission. And he made his way past Gilead, his hometown, Tishbet. And made his way to the palace of Ahab. The Bible tells us. And Elijah the Tishbite. Who was of the inhabitants of Gilead said unto Ahab. As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand. <laughs> For the first time the man of God shows up to the king. And his first declaration was. As the Lord thy God liveth. <laughs> Before whom I stand. Don't run past that church. Because it was reported openly clear. That Bea lived. And that Jehovah ceased to exist. He had to make a correction. <laughs> Jehovah was not dead. <laughs> As the Lord thy God liveth. Before whom I stand. Ahab, he may be dead to you and your people, but he's alive. Yeah. And let me tell you, church, you may see the apostasy taking hold of this church, but as the Lord God liveth before whom I stand, he will have some Elijahs. Yeah. He is not dead. Now, what gave this man this braveness to stand before the most powerful man in Israel? To give him such a charge as this. Take notes. Prior in private was his source of power in public. It was his prior in private that made him strong in public. <laughs> you have a wishy wishy prior life, you ain't gonna have no power. <laughs> If you're not praying earnestly, don't think you're going to stand in these last days that's coming. As I close, this man was praying. And he was studying. And he faced the king boldly. Told him what he needed to tell him. Before he says, There shall not be dew nor rain these years. Elijah could stand on this promise because he found it in the word of God. And the word of God came to him. Go show yourself to Ahab and tell Ahab this, that there shall not be rain nor dew these years. A matter of fact, Josephus, who was the, Jew, his, the, 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 the Jewish historian, he was quoting the Greek historian, his name is Menander, and he recorded that under him was want of rain from a secular source. So this is just not no Bible story. He was repairing the altar. And after the man gave his charge to the king, <laughs> we are told like a thunderbolt from this clear sky, <laughs> the messenger of impending judgment fell upon the ears of the wicked king. But before Ahab could recover from his astonishment, our frame, a reply, Elijah disappeared. <laughs> Abruptly as he had come without waiting to witness the effect of his message. <laughs> the man gave his message. Yes, and before the king could do, he was gone. <laughs> the 
God moved him. Church, we need the faith of Elijah. We need the power and spirit of Elijah. And as we go through these studies, we're going to pick up on the Elijah of the New Testament and so on and so forth. For three and a half years, there was no rain in Israel. Barrenness, dryness, thirstiness, <laughs> wantingness. Man gave his word and immediately <laughs> the word of God was fulfilled upon this idolatrous people. You see, because Baal, and we're going to talk about it further lecture. Remember, Baal was a storm god. <laughs> so you imagine throughout these three and a half years how much they were pay, praying to Baal. Because in their mind, it was Moth who took over. And they couldn't get back Baal from underground. There was a famine in the land for three and a half years. Amos says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. Not for bread and water, for the word of God. Amen. For three and a half years, the prophet's voice was silent. There was no word. It was shut up cause of apostasy they were seeking from the east to the west from the north to the south I'm making the application they were seeking the word of God but they could not find it day is coming beloved friends when you won't have a seat in this church the voice of the speaker would be silent not in debt, I hope, but in location. The voice of the pastor probably be silent. Not in debt, I hope, but in location. Many of us will be running from the east and from the west seeking a word. Today is your day of salvation. You have sat and you had listened for years under the preaching of this man of God. He has given you the word of God clear. God may move him to another location. Would you be seeking for a word? Or would you already have the word under this man's ministry? We're told those who had not prized God's words were hurrying to and fro. Wandering from sea to sea. From north to east to seek the word of the Lord, said the angel, they shall not find it. Here is a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but for hearing the word of the Lord. What would they not give for one word of approval from God? The prophet gave his word, and before king could reply he was gone church where are you this morning in your experience are you seeking to repair the altar of the lord or are you like one of baal's worshipers tearing it down the bible says examine yourself to see whether or not you're in the faith. Are you a reprobate? What are your station this morning? Are you a repairer of the breach? Or are you a destroyer? God will have a people in these last days. To repair the altar. And I pray, God, that all of you who are here under the hearing of my voice and those who are viewing us live, 
you have not yet made Jesus your Lord and Savior, I am here to tell you that you are tearing down the altar. You are not a repairer. You can't be on the fence, beloved friends. You must either for God or against him. You can't have two masters. You can only have one. And I am here to tell you bluntly, if you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, you are tearing down the altar. And I am here to tell you this morning that there shall not be dew nor rain these three years in your life until you repent and give God the glory. Amen. Your dew or rain may come in different forms this morning. May not be a literal rain or dew. But God will have his way of dealing with you. We are told that it is a hard thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Yes, yes. The God who thundered from Mount Sinai. Yes. The God who caused the earth to quake yes. and the people to tremble. He is a jealous God. Yes. Where are you this morning? There is hope for you. Today is your day of salvation. And if you have heard his voice, harden not your heart. Bow your heads with me as I pray. Eternal God and Father, we thank you, O God, that we have heard a word from your throne room. And we... In this edifice, dear God, we want to be on the side of Jehovah. We want to be the Elijahs of this 21st century. We want to be repairers of the breach. We want to be the restorers of path. We want to restore true worship in Israel. And we want to call sinners out of darkness into this marvelous light. Help us, dear God, that we will be a church in prayer. We will be a church that is working while we're praying. As Elijah made his way from Gilead to the palace of Ahab, help us to make our ways to the homes of lost, lost souls this afternoon. As we go out, dear God, to seek men and women to build up the kingdom of God, to show them that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Let your angels go before us. We claim your promise. And your word says, Go ye, make disciples of all nations, teaching and baptizing. And Lord, we are claiming that promise this afternoon. Go before us as we seek to go in the power and the spirit of Elijah. And help us, dear God, that you will save us at last when you come. And every voice will be hushed. And all those that stood against you will be silent. May we be among the few that will be saved at last. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.